The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation. Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. And supported by listeners like you, many of whom have donated on the Jerry Powell fundraising site, which you can find at www.jerrypowell.org, big blue button, or through reviews, stars on your favorite podcasting app. Big thank you. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? We are delighted to welcome back to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Lauren Ferrante, who is an intensivist and aging researcher at the Yale School of Medicine. Welcome back to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Lauren. Thanks for having me, Alex and Eric. Happy to and be we're here. delighted to welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Julian Colbert, who is an intensivist and aging researcher and palliative care researcher at the San Francisco VA Medical Center and UCSF. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Julian. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Eric. It's great to be here. So we're going to be talking about aging in the ICU, talking about some of the research you guys have done around disability, dementia, frailty, multimorbidity in the ICU. But before we go into that topic, Julian, I think you have a song request. I do. I do. So... um, I haven't heard much grunge on this uh, podcast. Yeah. So I um, uh, wanted to recre- uh, request Chris Cornell, uh, Like a Stone. Um, and I also want to see if uh, Alex can reach the uh, towering vocals of Chris Cornell. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll find out. <laughs> Good question. And aside from the lack of grunge, is there another reason you picked this song? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, Chris Cornell is one of my favorite musicians. Audio Slave is also uh, one of my um, uh, favorite bands. But I think that to me, the song is, um, while it might sound uh, a little bit depressing, um, it's actually uh, sneakily hopeful. Um, uh, so I just think it's a really poetic song. And uh, I like listening to it. All right, here we go. On a cobweb afternoon in a room full of emptiness by a freeway, I confess I was lost in the pages of a book full of death, reading how we die alone. And if we're good, we'll lay to rest anywhere we want to go. that one alex that was awesome that was amazing um, um, when i I'm close my eyes back. is audio- that audio slave that was not soundgarden that was audio slave right this is post soundgarden yeah post soundgarden um, i mean i when i closed my eyes i actually thought it, 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 <laughs> an actual recording of chris cornell it was amazing uh, uh, yeah it was really really <laughs> great you're a belt did he die three years back right Four years ago? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want to say like 2017, 2018, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really sad. So yeah. many people from that grunge era. Lead singer Alice in Chains. He was at Temple Nirvana. of the Dog. He was in mm-hmm. Audio Slave, Soundgarden. Mm-hmm. And then he had some, like a bunch of solo stuff after. Some people thought that this was written when the Alice in Chains lead singer, who I'm forgetting, uh, died, that he wrote this song. But I think it's I think it's kind of a hopeful song. I like it. Well, we'll get a little bit more of the song at the end of the podcast. Let's dive into what we're going to be talking about: aging in the ICU. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to you, Lauren. How did you get interested in this subject about you know the the aging population in the ICU and the geriatric conditions? That's a great question. Um, I I don't actually have a specific case. It was more, I was in my residency program um, at Columbia, New York City, and 
I think it was just a series of patients. And I, I noticed that I was taking care of older adults more and more. It, it seemed, or maybe I just noticed it more. And I was thinking a lot about what happens to them afterwards, because as you know, in the ICU, we just see them during their critical illness and then they're off to the floor. And at least that's the end of my interaction with them. And it was around this time that some landmark papers came out that, you know, earlier before this podcast, Julian had alluded to sort of the trends in this literature that's evolved over the past decade. And this was around the time that um, Jack Awashina's landmark paper came out in JAMA. And I just remember it like speaking to me and being like, yes, this is exactly what I'm interested in. And I really What was that paper? It was the one where he um, looked at, it used HRS data actually to look at um, long-term functional and cognitive outcomes um, among older, uh, actually uh, among older adults in the hospital, about 40% were in the ICU. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it, you know, a lot of us, again, I was only, I was a resident at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, A lot of us, you know, I think just realized it was really relevant. It was in sepsis patients, realized it was very relevant to the, to the ICU. And in my, when I went into residency, I didn't realize I was going to do critical care. I decided while I was a resident. And then once I was in, I was in, Mm -hmm. Um, and before I, well, even when I was interviewing for fellowship, I knew this was what I wanted to do. How about you, Julian? There was no uh, single moment where I, I started to, really think about where I wanted to basically dedicate my research career to thinking about um, how we approach older patients in the ICU and, and what their lives look like after. It was kind of this uh, this slow build, I would say. So I do remember, you know, one of these one of these moments in medical school where I was going down this very specific track of internal medicine and which I, I ended up doing, but um, I remember this moment where I was with a surgeon um, in a patient's room whereby uh, basically after the surgery or intra-op, they found uh, more metastases uh, than they had thought. And uh, post-operatively, they basically aborted the surgery. Post-operatively, when rounding, we went to the patient's room and uh, I distinctly remember I was like a second year medical student at Duke, where we did our rotations earlier, he um, basically had an end of life care discussion with this patient. And it culminated in him giving a Bud Light to the patient um, in the hospital room. Um, mm. because that was, I guess, the the only semblance of, of normalcy for this patient. And it just really struck there's struck a chord uh, and stuck with me. And basically ever since then, I've been thinking a lot more about how we approach these conversations, how, what lives look like before and after. And that eventually kind of led me to start asking some of these questions, but yeah, I mean, that's just a a memorable moment that I just distinctly remember. And then um, when I did residency in internal medicine first, um, there was just a, a lot of focus on, a lot of heroic management, um, in the ICU that didn't always appeal to me, um, without thinking about what the, Mm -hmm. what the morbidity might look like. So it's just kind of carried, carried with me through time. If I could just interject briefly with a couple of reflections on what you both said, the first regarding Julian, your experience of bringing the beer in Shunichi Nakagawa, who's a palliative care doc at Columbia, uh, recently tweeted when a patient requests to drink cold ice water before removing high flow nasal cannula to withdraw life support, that will be the last one in his life. Don't thicken it. Make sure he gets what he wants. Don't ask anybody. It won't take long. Go get it by yourself. And that has 34,000 likes, which for like a palliative care tweet is beyond uh, what uh, other tweets have achieved. Yeah, his Twitter feed though is brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. highly recommended. At S Nakagawa underscore MD, and we'll put the link to that in our in the post associated with this. And then, just going back to what Lauren was saying about Jack Washington's paper in JAMA, I mean that was such a seminal paper. Ken Kavinsky wrote about it for Jerry Powell. Back then, we were a blog, <laughs> and Ken's um, Ken's post uh, 
which is titled Survival from Severe Sepsis, The Infection is Cured But All is Not Well, is still one of our most viewed posts on Jerry Pal. Um, you know, um, severe sepsis is a syndrome marked by a severe infection that results in one organ failure. What happens when people survive? Um, uh, when patients leave the hospital, the, the infection may be cured, but the patient and family will need to contend with a host of major new functional and cognitive deficits. I mean, the, as you said, Lauren, like that paper really just crystallized for people. It's not just about the ICU. And we've talked with Wes Ely about his realization that this is about so much more than just the ICU care. What happens afterward is profoundly influenced by the experience of critical illness um, in the uh, in the intensive care setting. Um, so just wanted to interject. Lauren, looks like you had a follow-up there. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because as our program has grown, we've moved... Like we have a lot of studies in the ICU, but also in the post ICU space. And I've had people ask me um, why I'm doing that because I'm an intensivist. Um, and there's actually some controversy around this, you know, like my scope of practice is the ICU, not even my scope of practice. No one uses that word, but just like, why am I trying to fix these or address mm -hmm. these problems? But I think of it, it's, it's really a continuum of care and, um, you know, I think we all have to be thinking about post ICU recovery, not just when we're having these important conversations in the ICU, but as the person goes to the floor, as they go home, like what can we all do to help these patients recover? So I'm glad you brought that up. Well, let, let's go into the, the, the topic a little bit. I think there's three really important papers I want to talk about, both kind of where we are right now. What do we know about the functional trajectories and what happens after people leave the ICU? Um, Julian, let's start off with congratulations, by the way. Uh, and Lauren, too, the chess paper that just got published on trends in geriatric conditions among older mm -hmm. adults in the ICU between 1998 and 2015. Um, tell me a little bit, first of all, before we talk about what you found in this, why did you do this study? Um, it's a good question. So, I, I mean, um, a lot of a lot of the ideas that I have and had uh, uh, regarding looking at um, older adults in the ICU, <laughs> it really stems a lot from Lauren's work. Um, quite honestly, um, her papers uh, or amazing work kind of led to some of these questions. And and um, and full disclosure, Lauren was a collaborator on this study. Um, so <clears throat> so basically. The original intention that I had was how are older adult patients doing post ICU stay when they're coming in with various um, pre existing geriatric conditions. And before we even uh, could answer that question, I had to take a step back and just simply ask the question of how many older adults are coming in with pre existing geriatric conditions and are those changing over time um, before we can even. Um, uh, look at the outcomes and the, and the implications based on those outcomes. So, uh, so this is not necessarily a new idea. Um, Jack uh, Washna kind of did some similar work using the HRS in different cohorts. Um, and he really emphasized, this is now 10 years ago, how you really have to understand and um, think about the pre-existing conditions and functional status of patients uh, in order to, to understand the implications of morbidity in survivors. So that led us to really just ask the question of how have uh, disability, frailty, dementia, and multimorbidity at the time of ICU admission in older adults uh, changed um, over the last decade plus, and where are we now? So we uh, isolated older adults, 65 and older, that's how we defined it, um, using uh, the health and retirement study. Um, and we basically um, looked at first all the patients who had um, uh, pre existing geriatric conditions at their first ICU admission and just tabulated that um, and then adjusted for various other uh, um, covariates. And then we finally ended up finding that at the end of our study period, which ended up being 2015, just because we didn't have the more recent data until very recently now, um, that a quarter of these older adults had pre-existing disability, uh, nearly half had 
frail, uh, were frail using our definition, um, adapted from the literature and three quarters had multimorbidity again, how we defined it. And I thought that was pretty striking. Yeah. Well, um, why do you think that is? Why, why are these numbers increasing? Is it that disability, frailty, multimorbidity is either increasing the population or we're coding it better, or I guess it's HRS data. So it's, um, or is it just the the population that we're caring for in the ICU is having in general, like we're, we're selecting for sicker and sicker patients or more frail patients? Yeah, I think this, it's a great question. I think I, I don't have a, a, I don't, I don't know uh, quite honestly, but I think what might be happening is the patients who we are admitting, and by the way, all of this has probably kind of changed uh, um, with COVID, but I've heard about that. Some <laughs> pandemic that's going on. Um, yeah. I think one part of it, and I'm, I'm really curious to hear what Lauren's thoughts are, is that I think we're doing a really good job preventing patients from, from coming into the ICU, especially, uh, compared to the start of, of our study period, um, which was in like the late nineties, early aughts. Um, I think we're probably managing sicker patients on the floor. I think we um, have developed our trans transitional care units and step-down units pretty well. Um, I think we're probably um, uh, shunting different patient populations to the ICU now compared to how what we were doing previously. I think that there are some interesting um, patterns that we saw in this study whereby dementia, the rates of, of pre-existing dementia and cognitive impairment didn't really change. Age did increase, but not substantially, roughly about a year. So I'm guessing that it may have to do with how we're managing these patients on the floor and potentially even preventing certain um, critical illness or managing more quote unquote critical illness in these um, transitional care units compared to what we were doing before. That's just yeah. one hypothesis. What do you think, Lauren? Yeah, I mean, in addition to what Julian's saying, I, I do think the aging of the population does have something to do with it. I mean, the population's aging overall. And as you know, a lot of these geriatric conditions, they we know that their prevalence increases with age. I mean, it was like think about like the original, like Linda Freed's original paper, right? With where she has like each of the age categories and you see the prevalence of frailty increasing. Um that said, I think we, and I, I, I mean a collective we, not just in critical care, I think we as a healthcare system, like I think we're really good at keeping people alive. And so the combination of the two um, results in, you know, an increasingly older population in the ICU that's going to have a higher prevalence of geriatric conditions. Now, of course, that's really important for everyone to know. I don't, I don't know that, like, you know, I think this is such a great paper, Julian, because everybody knows that the population is aging, right? You hear this all the time. Um, and we all thought that we figured that the prevalence of these conditions would be increasing as the population ages, but now you've gone ahead and you've shown it. Um, and so we can take that as, you know, now this is, this is known, this is demonstrated, and this is something we all have to be thinking about as we mm -hmm. care for, for these patients. Yeah. And the paper, the mean age of the population over this 11 year time period rose about a year uh, but even when you, and a year actually has a profound effect um, uh, 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 on outcomes we're looking at. But over that 11 year period, if you were a ICU critical care physician, you know, the average uh, ICU critical care physician saw that, you know, 15% of their patients had pre existing disability at the beginning of the time period. And by the end, it was 24%. And that frailty was 36% at the beginning, up to 45% at the end. And multimorbidity, 54% up to 72%. Um, so huge increases just over that about a decade. Um, uh, and, you know, so where are we headed? What's, go what's going to be the future in, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Um, certainly, as you say, Lauren, we, we're doing more and more to keep people alive longer and longer. Um, and uh, we're building critical care uh, facilities uh, and filling them. And certainly we can take care of patients at more advanced ages. And we're showing, you know, we have to be careful, uh, cautious against ageism here. And mm -hmm. that, in fact, we probably could have done more for some select patients who are critically ill um, in the intensive care unit. Uh, 
Uh, on the other hand, there is one story that tr bucks the trend, which is dementia did not change significantly over the time period. It remained relatively flat. So also curious of your thoughts about why these other conditions rose, but not dementia. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I, I keep on coming back to, um, we did also control for age um, as another element to this. And we still saw these increases. I totally agree with Lauren. I mean, the, the baseline patient population is, is aging and it, it would have been, I think much more straightforward if after adjusting for age, literally everything kind of uh, was stable. Um, so I, I keep by looking at the dementia data and the cognitive impairment data, which essentially did not change over time. I am wondering whether it's the conversations and preparation that some um, primary care providers and outpatient providers are having with a lot of these, these patients and families to um, either prevent an ICU admission or potentially uh, address their goals such that they don't go into the ICU. I keep on coming back to whether uh, we're just doing a better job better might be a, the wrong word here, but we're doing, we're changing how we're managing these patients before they even come to the ICU. And that is affecting the patients that we're admitting to the ICU. Yeah, so you, you didn't say advanced care planning there, but you used all of the other words, <laughs> 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 but it, which is of course a controversial topic right now, given Sean Morrison's um, commentary and colleagues commentary and JAMA about advanced care planning. But so well, I, I got a question. Um, because it was it was a ways back, but we did a podcast on keep your hands to yourself from a JAMA IM article that showed that use of mechanical ventilation for nursing home residents with advanced dementia doubled between 2000 and 2013. Uh, that was a Joan mm -hmm. Tino study. How do I reconcile these two issues? I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually going to add that onto what Julian mm -hmm. said that, you know, even though the rates of dementia haven't gone up, and I do think it's because of what Julian said, I think there's so much more that's known now about Alzheimer's and, you know, out in the general public, and hopefully providers are having these conversations, but we can't really take too much comfort in it because of those findings that you just mentioned by Joan Tino, like they're among the patients who are admitted to the ICU who already have advanced dementia, it seems like the intensity of care is increasing over time. What I'm about to say is based more on personal observation than, um, than data, but it just seems like we're selecting for a population where either it's not so much the patient, right? At that stage, they can't really express their wishes, but where the family or or, or some confluence of factors where there isn't actually uh, a surrogate who can speak with the patient's voice um, results in more aggressive care happening than I think many of us think uh, should happen. So, you know, maybe the person with advanced dementia is coming in from the nursing home and nobody can find the living will from however many years ago. And then in the ED, like, you know, you intubate and then you figure it out later. Or, um, you know, the patient never had an advanced care planning document or, and now the family is making the decision. And it's, it's really hard to watch your loved one die. Even if you think you have anticipated this moment before, there's a lot of literature out there about, you know, there's advanced care planning and then there's what happens in that moment. Um, and so I think, I think what we're seeing is, you know, a number of different reasons and, and you're just selecting for people where they end up getting more aggressive, aggressive care. And Lauren, I mean, it, it sounds like, frailty, disability, multimorbidity are all increasing in the ICU. What do we know? And this stems from a lot of the work that you've done. What do we know about what happens after uh, the ICU? What are, what are the outcomes? Not just mortality, but disability. Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, I'm glad you said not just mortality, but disability, because then all of our work, you know, and based on others' work, where like Terry Fried's work, where um, older adults have expressed that function is their most important outcome. That's why disability is always our primary outcome um, for most of this post ICU work. So, um, so for the two studies I'll mention, we use data from the Precipitating Events Project at Yale, which is Tom Gill's amazing cohort where they followed uh, 
a cohort of initially non-disabled community dwelling older adults with monthly measures of function. Um, and so the key there is, of course, these were prospectively measured where patients were called every month um, from 1998 through actually the present day among those who are still alive. Um, and then we linked that cohort with administrative data, which allowed me to pull out the ICU admissions um, in addition to manually abstracting all of the paper data from for the managed Medicare participants. Um, so we have this nice ICU cohort that has monthly functional measures before and after the ICU admission. And so what we learned from um, one of our earlier papers is that the functional trajectory where you're characterizing um, function for the entire year before and the entire year after, when you look at the pre-ICU functional trajectory, that's High, strongly associated with how the person does afterwards in terms of their trajectory of disability and also um, with death. And I, I actually, although everyone tends to look at the curves in that paper, I think that for those of us practicing, the most helpful figure is the probability table mm. because it really tells you what is your probability based on how you're coming in of being on a certain functional trajectory after you leave this ICU. And so you, if you look, the group that comes in with minimal disability, where they have, I think the mean disability count before the ICU is like less than one, hmm. their chance of ending up severely disabled after an ICU admission, it's quite low. It's only about 13%, although 12% of them achieve, have early death, but their probability of a really bad outcome is about 25%. Whereas if you're coming in with some accelerating moderate level of disability or probability of the poor outcome, meaning a bad disability trajectory or death is much higher. And then there's this group at the top that's coming in very severely disabled heading into the ICU. And unsurprisingly, many, many of those, will, many of them will die. And among those who survive, they're not going to get better. They stay on that trajectory of severe disability. And although that latter point might seem obvious, it's, it's pretty important if, you know, in talking to patients, if you're admitting someone to the ICU who's truly just completely disabled in pretty much every task of activity of daily living and other activities. You know, you can use that when you're talking to families about prognostication. So, so what we learned from that is that how well you're functioning in the year leading up um, is really um, important in terms of how your functional trajectory afterwards and also um, survival. Mm -hmm. And what was early death in that study? That was death within 30 days. But as a secondary outcome, we also looked at one-year mortality. And for the secondary outcome of one-year mortality, we found that the effect size for the pre-ICU functional trajectory was basically the same as, as the need for mechanical ventilation. Yeah. We try to make that point because it speaks to especially ICU providers. You know, right. we, know, we know how bad that is. I love the way you did that to put the finding in context for the people who you're trying to communicate this to. Um, I think it was similar to, was, wasn't it both mechanical ventilation and was it sepsis? Shock. 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 Yeah. Shock. Yeah. Shock. But, um, yeah. I think everyone really understand. Yeah. Understand. Mm -hmm. Especially like we were talking about before with Joan Tino's findings, like we all really understand mechanical ventilation. So mm -hmm. that's why we usually frame it that way. And then um, Eric, you asked about follow-up work. So looking at frailty, we used the same mm -hmm. cohort with the monthly measures of function but for this, you know, in the PEP cohort, they also went into patients' homes every 18 months and did these very comprehensive assessments, including freed frailty once it was available. And so we pulled out and those... Reminder, our, letter, our, our listeners, the freed frailty, um, I always have to remind myself, what are the different frailty indices? What's covered in that one? Yep. That's a great question. So it's a five-component scale, and it includes slow gait speed we can grip strength, exhaustion, unintentional weight loss, and low physical activity, which I really like thinking about those components because when you picture that in your mind, you know, it's easy to, to think about what a frail person might look like. Mm -hmm. But I just want to say it's still so important to measure frailty because it really drives me crazy when I'm in the ICU and someone says someone looks frail. I have this figure that I use when I give talks and, and I, it was inspired by um, another, I want to say Sean Bagshaw, 
um, where if you take any older adult, you know, you put them under like a white hospital sheet, you could say they look frail and then you take off the sheet and it's actually like a marathon runner, you know, uh, so it's really robust. <laughs> that's um, a good, so that's a good yeah, one. It's like, actually it's very important to measure frailty, but those yeah. are the five components, um, for the freed frailty index. And that's what, uh, there are different frailty measures. That's yeah. a whole topic could be a topic for a whole other podcast, but we did a podcast. Linda oh, really? We talked all about this Freed. stuff, <laughs> yep. but I and, always uh, have to remind myself. Yes. And we did one with Tom Gill about the Precipitating Events Project um, back in 2017, early days for us, um, when he talked about restricting symptoms uh, and hospice. Uh, and also we talked about uh, how did he keep this remarkable cohort going um, during that time, and he requested Stairway to Heaven. Okay, back to uh, back to Lauren about frailty. <laughs> yeah. So, what happens? Uh, are we seeing similar stuff with frail patients in the ICU? Yeah. Well, not exactly. So it's really interesting. Um, so we looked at the pre again the the this cohort is so it's such a wealth of data because these are prospectively measured frailty assessments, right? Usually when the IC, we have inception cohorts and we have to try to measure something or there's this chance of recall bias and frailty. If you can't really get up and walk the critically Ill, older adult across the ICU to measure school gate speed. So we have these prospectively measured pre-ICU frailty assessments. And what we found was that the association with post-ICU disability count. So again, the monthly disability count over the six months after discharge um, that frailty was strongly associated with that. So I want to say the frail patients had a 41% increased burden of disability and the pre-frail patients had a 28% increased burden of disability. So that, that part was not surprising. Um, although again, still thinking about what that means for an individual older adult, um, is, is really important. And to that end, we had two secondary outcomes in the study the first one was the risk of new nursing home admission, um, going along with this whole idea of an older adult losing independence. Mm -hmm. And so for that, frailty was associated with that outcome, but not free frailty. And then we also looked at um, the risk of death. And this was really interesting. We have Kaplan-Meier curves in the paper. And you see that the frail group drops off and there's this increased risk of death or increased hazard of death. But the pre-frail and the non-frail groups run exactly together along mm. the top. The risk of death was not, not that much greater among the pre-frail. And it's really interesting because if you look at um, other studies, like using the um, using other cohorts, like one out of Canada, and you look at and they've used the clinical frailty scale, they have similar like Kaplan Meyer curves where it's the really frailty that's driving that risk of mortality. And mm. pre-frailty, you're not seeing it as much. So I got a question. So we're seeing increased trends for frailty, multimorbidity, population is aging in the ICU. We're also seeing, you know, not great outcomes after the ICU for a lot of these folks, although again, some variation. Should we argue that, you know, we should really think about who we're admitting to the ICU or is it arguing that we should be doing something different in the ICU or do we just not know yet what we're supposed to be doing with this data? Julian, what are your thoughts? I like this question. Um, I think that... Um, I think it's really, really complicated. I think that we're only starting to understand and, and, and stratify patients based on whether they're older adults or not, based on frailty and functional status and things that are no longer about mortality, which is kind of my favorite part about all of these questions, because we're starting to think a little bit more about patient-centered outcomes. I think, sorry, let me actually go back to your question. Your question was kind of, what do we make of this data and yeah. how, um, how should we kind of be thinking about managing patients in the ICU about, or whether they should even go to the ICU? Is yeah. I think that we should definitely be asking questions about patient goals, family goals, and trying to ensure that everything that we do is goal concordant, um, especially, and that, that starts, well, it starts for me about whether they should even enter the ICU itself. It probably should start even before then. Um, it's interesting to kind of think about early in the pandemic, there was um, the guidelines 
out of Europe, nice guidelines out of Europe were kind of asking the question about who should enter the ICU. And there was a lot of controversy about um, taking under consideration the uh, frailty of the patient um, as uh, as a determination of whether they might benefit from certain um, from ICU care, or the ICU admission itself, which was pretty controversial. I think that we're only starting to understand how some of the management decisions that we make in the ICU will impact uh, morbidity uh, and functional status in in older adults. Yeah, I we think just had it, Wes Ely on on a podcast talking about all the all the things that that he's done around this, and it just reminds me of man, I get a little frail every time I walk in the ICU. It's beeping, it's buzzing, it's loud. You hear all these conversations around you because it's kind of open. It, you can't even close a door very well, and it's very it's a deliriogenic environment. And in part, it's hard to get around that because all the alarms that are going off, not even in your room, but elsewhere, and people aren't being, you know, you know, there's not as much PT, OT going on. I loved our Wes Ely podcast because maybe, um, maybe we should be changing the way we think about how we care for older adults and really anybody in the ICU. Lauren, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I do agree with that. I do want to circle back to your other question that you guys were just talking about before I answer that, which is Uh to say that we actually have a big measurement problem. And I think we're far from being ready to decide based on these um, geriatric conditions. Who's the measurement problem? The measurement problem is nobody's measuring these factors regularly. Mm -hmm. So again, we can have someone who says, I think that person looks frail, but maybe the guy was like, you know, running two miles a day. I'm I'm exaggerating here, but you know, perhaps it's someone who's really robust, but right now we don't have routine frailty measurements. We don't have routine measures of functional status when the person's admitted to the hospital or the ICU or shows up in the ED. So how could you, how could we possibly make any decisions about who's admitted without even knowing those, um, you know, who has which geriatric conditions. So the way I've put that together is I, I do think it's important for us to assess for function, you know, disability and functional activities, frailty, cognitive impairment, absolutely. A lot of times we don't have that information until the person's already in the ICU. But then we can use that information to guide treatment preferences in, con- you know, in conversations with the patient and family if the patient's able to participate. So at least in my practice, that's often how this has happened, unless these conversations have taken place beforehand, either in the emergency room or um, with primary care providers. Yeah. Yeah. Lauren, I I totally, totally agree with you. I I think like we're only starting to understand some of this data. And what's striking to me is that when you kind of go back to the beeping and and buzzing alarm studies and like trying to change individual environment, like trying to make like one environmental modification and looking at outcome changes. I haven't seen really great evidence that these individual small interventions are making um, huge dents on some of some of our outcomes of interest. What I, what the data I think does show much more of is that these bundles of care, um, we use one like A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, mm-hmm. which is, which is commonly kind of employed in a lot of ICUs. Um, it seems to have a better effect on, on some of the outcomes that we're looking at. But every time we, we look at one of these individual interventions, we're not always seeing what we want to see. And I think it probably has to do with, with or a huge part of that probably has to do with, with um, how we're measuring really the measurement problem that you're kind of saying. I think we're only starting to acquire this data and it's going to take a lot of time to figure out which specific interventions will match to the right patient populations. Um, but right now all we have is kind of the bundle seems to work. Um, yeah, kind of like I'm glad you that up. 20 years ago. What'd you say? Sorry. Kind of like sepsis 20 years ago. Um, and kind of what is happening in the operating room literature on enhanced recovery after surgery literature 10 years ago. Um, mm-hmm. bundles seem to work every time we take away a part of that bundle though, as the culture changes, we're not seeing a huge, a huge negative effect. Um, so I think it's going to take some time for us to, to get to that point where we have a much more nuanced mm-hmm. understanding of, of these measurements. 
Before it gets to his magic wand question and we wrap it up, I wanted to give each of you, is my last question, I want to give each of you a chance to just give us a preview of what you're working on now, maybe starting with Lauren. Sure. So, well, I guess I'll start since Julian just mentioned the ABCDEF bundle. So we actually are working in a few different areas, but I guess what's most relevant to that is we're actually working to build a geriatrics bundle that we can kind of build on to ABCDEF because To your point, you know, my observation has been that in the ICU, bundles and checklists have been really effective over the years, right? If you think all the way back to the checklist from 20 years ago and then the bundle, to your point, I think we still have work to do on implementation of the bundle as a a practice, as critical care, you know, specialty, but we're working to to develop. So we've just completed a pilot study that was funded by the Pepper Center Network. And then we, you know, in terms of outcomes, we're starting to explore things that are probably hopefully even more modifiable. So things in like social domains and um, coming out soon, we have a, we actually have a COVID cohort of older adults who were hospitalized with COVID that that study Mm -hmm. just completed follow-up. We'll be presenting some of those results. It's called the Valiant study. So, um, and I'll just, I'll just mention those three things since they're kind of relevant to some of the topics we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Julian, what um, I think uh, so. I'm I'm still very early in my in my research career. I think Alex uh, Alex is one of my mentors, and um, he's trying to rein me in. Um, but I, I think I've become particularly interested in in kind of what Lauren's describing as as the measurement problem, and I'm trying to find different ways of measuring uh, certain things. So I've gone down a path of um, of looking at unstructured data within within ICU notes uh, using natural language processing to kind of um, understand how we are measuring uh, some of these impairments, but more so how are we talk about these patients and how we potentially think about these patients and how we are communicating that in the, the words that we write in notes. And I'm particularly interested in how we uh, think about palliative care measures and metrics uh, using unstructured notes. Um, so that's one of my buckets, but I'm also continuing a lot of this work, uh, using, um, the HRS, uh, potentially looking at what positive features could be impacting not only mortality outcomes, but morbidity outcomes in ICU survivors. My last question, uh, the, the magic wand is running out of battery. So it has to be a short one. If you had a magic wand to fix anything pre- during or post ICU, geriatricize any of it or to, to deal with this issue, what would you use that on, Lauren? I would love to have functional assessments on everyone before they entered the hospital or ICU. I want them like built into the EMR and done like on everyone in the whole country all the time. And functional <laughs> so assessment is more thought. than just, oh, this person looks a little frail. Right. No, like right. measurement of, you know, just, it's not that hard to do actually. I mean, Ken Kavinsky's shown this, other have shown that others have shown this, right. You just ask, yeah. ask about disability and activities of daily living, ideals, mobility. Julian, it's got a little bit of power left. What are you going to use that magic wand on? I want aggressive uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy um, for every single one of our patients all the time, multiple times a day. How about uh, while they're ventilated in the ICU, would you do that too? Absolutely. Absolutely. All of the above. Great. Um, and I really want to encourage people to, uh, Wes Ely writes beautifully about that in his book. Um, oh shoot. I'm blinking on the title. I got it here somewhere. Alex, you remember? Every deep drawn breath. There Every you go. Breath. We do mobilize people in the ICU. That's in our program, six out of seven days of the week. Well, even if Great. you're on the bench. Yes. <laughs> Great. Absolutely. Well, how about we get a little bit more audio slave, Alex? <laughs> before we end this podcast. All right, here we go. On my deathbed, I will pray to the gods and the angels, to the pagans, or anyone who will take me to heaven, to a place I recall I was there so long ago The sky was bruised, the wine was bled And there you led me on
Absolutely. Hey, Julie, I got to ask. You said you, you you feel like this was more of an optimistic song. For me, you know, you have an old it's man so waiting in a house alone, waiting for his death. Tell me. I didn't... <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to admit this, but I actually just sent a quick chat to Lauren that said, um, uh, maybe this song might've been a little too depressing, which we didn't tell you. Um, I think it's, I think it's, um, um, the, the, the author is, is trying to reconnect with the people that he's, that he or she has lost. And, um, and I think that there's optimism to, uh, there, there's a hope, there's a sense of hope despite waiting for one's death and death does not have to be this, this hopeless event. That's nice regret- on Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> As we're, record- we're recording this on Valentine's Day. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I said I think it's a beautiful song, actually. I didn't know it beforehand, but I actually really love it. I think it's really pretty. Well, and Julian, and Lauren, uh, thank you for being on our podcast. Thanks so much for having us. This was really thank fun. You. This was great. Thank you so much. Thank Big you. Thank you to Archstone Foundation and to all our listeners. We'd also like to acknowledge the generous support for our Jerry Powell listeners who've donated over $250 each to support the Jerry Powell podcast, including Meg Walhagen, Thomas Quinn, Rochelle Bernacki, Louise Aronson, James Tulski, Arden O'Donnell, Mike Steinman, Mary Ann Forcia, Ashok Krishnaswamy, Nancy Lunderberg, Gail Cooney, David Schiffeling, Cheryl Phillips, and Jessica Eng. Thank you very much.